Hello from Xiamen University. So did you know that in 1895, just across the bay in Zhangzhou, a Chinese was born who was nominated twice for the Nobel Prize in Literature? His writings in both Chinese and English made him one of the most influential writers of the early 20th century. And he did more to help bridge the gap between East and West than anyone else I know. He's one of my favorite people, Ling Yutang. Ling Yutang was born on October 10th, 1895 in Pinghe, Zhangzhou, Fujian, and he lived until he died in Taiwan on March 26, 1976. He always considered himself a mountain child. And in one book, he said that his idea of hell was a city apartment. <laughs> he was a Chinese inventor, linguist, novelist, philosopher, and translator. His father was a Christian minister and Lin went from Christianity to Taoism and Buddhism and back to Christianity. So he had rich insights on many religious philosophies of both East and West. After getting his PhD in Germany, he taught at Peking University. The new cultural movement criticized China's tradition as futile and harmful, but Lin immersed himself in the Confucian text and literary culture. And he produced a humor magazine Lun Yu Banyu Khan from 1932 to 40 and 1945 to 49 with articles by such famous writers as Lu Xun. He also promoted the Western concept of humor and in 1924, he coined the Chinese word for humor, Yomo. In 1933, Lu Xun attacked Lin Yutang's magazine for being apolitical, but he remained friendly with Lin and continued to contribute to his journal. After 1935, Lin lived mainly in the United States, where he wrote many bestsellers, including My Country and My People in 1935, and my favorite, The Importance of Living. Westerners liked Lin Yutang, but they became angry when his book Between Tears and Laughter in 1943 criticized Western racism and imperialism. He was also an inventor. Many people thought a Chinese typewriter was impossible, but Lin worked on it for decades and finally brought one to market during the war with Japan. Lin did much to bridge the gap between East and West, and he was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1940 and 1950. He worked until his death in 1976 and was buried at his home in Yangmingshan, Taipei, Taiwan. His home has been turned into a museum which is operated by Taipei-based Suzhou University, and the town of Lin's birth, Banzai in, in Changchou, has also preserved the original Lin home and turned it into a museum. You can visit it. I encourage you to read more about Lin Yutang's life and to read his books. And below, I'll share a few of my favorite quotes from his books, including several about the importance of reading and at the end, about dreaming. My dad said to me when I was young that just because we did not have money didn't mean we were poor and that books were the great equalizer. Books allowed me to learn anything or to go anywhere in my imagination. And thanks to the public library, I always had plenty to read. That's why reading is one of my three favorite hobbies to this day. So now some quotes from Lin Yutang. There is something in the nature of tea that leads us into a world of quiet contemplation of life. And since Ling Yutang was in Minanrin, he probably said, Nde, Pleta. He said, There is so much to love and to admire in this life that it is an act of ingratitude not to be happy and content in this existence. The next one I really love. For a Westerner, it is usually sufficient for a proposition to be logically sound. For a Chinese, it is not sufficient that a proposition be logically correct, but it must be at the same time in accord with human nature. He said, those who are wise won't be busy. Those who are too busy can't be wise. When small men begin to cast big shadows, it means that the sun is about to set. He also had some quotes about reading. He was not only a prolific writer, but also of course a voracious reader. He said, the wise man reads both books and life itself. Anyone who reads a book with a sense of obligation does not understand the art of reading. There is no proper time and place for reading. When the mood for reading comes, one can read anywhere. There are no books in this world that everybody must read. 
but only books that a person must read at a certain time in a given place under given circumstances and at a given period of his life. The man who has not the habit of reading is imprisoned in his immediate world in respect to time and space. His life falls into a set routine. He is limited to contact and conversation with the few friends and acquaintances, and he sees only what happens in his immediate neighborhood. From this prison, there is no escape. But the moment he takes up a book, he immediately enters a different world. And it is as if it's, it's as if a good book, he is immediately put in touch with one of the best talkers of the world. This talker leads him on and carries him into a different country or a different age or unburdens to him some of his personal regrets or discusses with him some special line or aspect of life that the reader knows nothing about. An ancient author puts him in communion with a dead spirit of long ago. And as he reads along, he begins to imagine what the ancient author looks like and what type of person he was. Besides the noble art of getting things done, there is the noble art of leaving things undone. The wisdom of life consists in the elimination of non-essentials. If you can spend a perfectly useless afternoon in a perfectly useless manner, you have learned how to live. Lastly, though he urged contentment, he also valued dreaming which is related to hope. He said, hope is like a road in the country. There was never a road, but when many people walk on it, the road comes into existence. So why dream? We talk about the China dream. A hundred years ago, he talked about why we should dream. So let's look at some quotes about dreaming. To lack the ability to imagine and to dream is an easy road to contentment indeed, like the cow that chews the grass day in, day out. Mm. <laughs> Yet what sort of existence is that? What sort of wonders can be spun from those threads? Whether as individuals or as nations, we all dream and act more or less in accordance with our dreams. Some dreams are a little more than others, as there is a child in every family who dreams more, and perhaps one who dreams less. Human progress without this imaginative gift is itself unthinkable. Those dreams of our childhood, they are not so unreal as we may think. Somehow they stay with us throughout our life. And so out in the alley, up in an attic, or down in the barn, or lying along the waterside, a child always dreams, and the dreams are real. So Thomas Edison dreamed. So Robert Louis Stevenson dreamed, so Walter Scott dreamed. All three dreamed in their childhood and out of the stuff of such magic dreams are woven some of the finest and most beautiful fabrics we have ever seen. People fight for their dreams as much as they fight for their earthly possessions. And so dreams descend from the world of idle visions and enter the world of reality and become a real force in our life. However vague they are, dreams have a way of concealing themselves and leave us no peace until they are translated into reality, like seeds germinating underground, sure to sprout in their search for the sunlight. Dreams are very real things. So the lesson from all of this, read, dream, and then make those dreams real. Come xia li.